took me long enough to get around to making a second one of these. Anyways, if you watched the first, you know what we're doing here. If you haven't, then just like, read the title, it's not that complicated. We've got so many games, but so little time, so let's get started with the first. The Visual Novel Echo Dropping the internet character for a bit, I started playing this game as a communications major in the middle of college, which is exactly what the protagonist of this game is. When the game talks about Chase pulling out his camera for a school project and adjusting the white balance, that's something that I know. That's something that I've done. This game hit me harder than it does most, to the point that I'm exclusively using footage from the game's prologue because I think this is 1000% something you should play for yourself. Keep in mind, this game is raw, heavy, and intense, with content that's not suitable for children and designed to make adults uncomfortable. It took me nearly half a year just to get through this game. Not that it's bad, it's genuinely one of the best games I ever played. I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10 just so you know. The writing is stellar, the art is good, and it's easy to see why it's considered a masterpiece. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me pull back. Don't let the furry characters fool you. Echo is a horror visual novel, and it's a damn good one. Made by the team Echo Project and is a part of the Echoverse, which comprises three visual novels which share the same setting but different time periods. The Smoke Room takes place in the Wild West when the gold rush town of Echo was new and fresh. Arches takes place in the modern day when the town of Echo is pretty much all but abandoned. And the one we're talking about is the one that started it all. The game simply titled Echo. The game is rated 18 and up, and while it doesn't show anything explicit, it does go out of its way to describe it. You play as Chase Hunter, a college otter returning to his shitty hometown to reunite with his friends for break. We have TJ, the religious kid, Jenna, the mom of the group, Leo, the closest thing the group has to a dad, Carl, the weed smoker, and Flynn, the one who wants to know the truth. The truth of what, you ask? Well, way back in the day, when all of them were kids, they had another friend, Sydney. But he drowned in Lake Emma and died, or at least that's what the only one to see what happened says. It's this one event that pervades the entire narrative and defines who these characters are. They're all united in this shared nightmare, but they all have their own personal nightmare. Shitty home lives, anxiety issues, obsessions, and paranoias that you get to see in depth because Echo is a game that should be a visual novel. If you've never played a visual novel before, know that visual novels basically play like one giant social link from Persona, although I suppose it'd be better to say social links play more like small visual novels. Echo takes advantage of its medium by basically giving every one of the main characters their own story with their own ending. After a short prologue, you're given the option to select which character to follow and thus decide basically how the entire game goes. Not only does it keep each of your runs through the game fresh by always giving you something different, but it also gives the game the opportunity to ask and answer a lot of questions of what happens between each run. So as you read through each route, you're slowly putting together the pieces of character and world building. You not only learn what happened to Sydney, but you also learn what happened before that. You can see all the ways this town can fuck with and utterly destroy the people in it. There's even a few bad endings to get along the way, so be careful with your choices. Across all the routes, you get this genuine understanding of the world and the people in it, and why they're all as fucked up as they are. They try to hide these scars from their past, but they're constantly rubbing up against each other. And that's part of what makes Echo so intense is the friction between these characters. Like, you know things are going to blow up, that fights are going to happen, but the characters are written to feel like real people. Like, these fights aren't happening for the sake of the plot, these are just the natural results of these people with unresolved issues being together. It makes you hate them, but also pity them, like watching lobsters try to climb out of a boiling pot. There's a lot of thematic undertones to the story it's telling, with a lot of the more spooky and supernatural stuff being allegory for things like mental health. You see these metaphors made literal affect the characters and send them spiraling down as the mass hysteria takes hold. 
you slowly learn that your initial impression of the characters are off base as the underlying issues become more and more apparent. Like, let's use the protagonist for example, because unlike other visual novels, this one's not an insert, he's an actual character. Very early in the story, he's actually called out for being a visual novel protagonist, bland, boring, and passive. And as you go through Roots, you learn more and more about him that changes your opinions of him. In fact, Chase himself is probably the most divisive character in the visual novel. There's people who think he's the victim, the perpetrator, and just straight up the main antagonist. Echo takes a lot of the tropes other visual novels use and manages to put them in a new context and light that makes it clear how horrifying those tropes are in reality. You can want to dote and protect a character too much. That love interest who always gives you attention is not the kind of partner you want. I know this part of the video has been all over the place, but it is really hard to talk about Echo without spoiling things. It's the kind of game with hidden details that only makes sense way later and then you're just like, whoa. Spoiler alert for those that want to throw themselves into the game blind, go to this timestamp to avoid it. Echo makes heavy use of sound design, and one of the pieces that shows up often is this one. However, later you learn of something called the hum, a sign of Echo twisting those within its borders. And it's described as this long droning sound, like a tuning orchestra. The moments that it hits is the moment your mind is just blown. It recontextualizes so many interactions, lacing them over with this added layer of tension, knowing characters are being twisted around and fucked up. Welcome back to those who skip to the timestamp. I've barely been able to touch upon what makes Echo great in this short review. Like how even the name of the game, Echo, relates to this story about trauma, how it never goes away and will continue to affect us even after it passes. Like an Echo. I plan to make a full length video essay talking about my thoughts on the game at some point. I just gotta collect the footage first, but Echo is so heavy and deep you'd have to kill me before I replay it again. That won't stop me from giving Echo a 10 out of 10. It's free to play on PC and Android and I have a link to it in the description. You have no excuse not to play it. For the next game, we have something a little different. So who here has heard of Black Sad? What's different about this one is that rather than just being a video game, Black Sad is primarily a comic book series. Pinned by these two guys, it follows the exploits of a noir cat detective trying to do his best in an unjust world and yada yada yada. If you're into that sort of thing, hell, even if you aren't into that sort of thing, I'd recommend you give the comics a read. I'm a pretty big fan of the series, to the point that I own every comic hardcover, so it should come as no surprise that I've also ended up playing the game. Black Sad Under the Skin is one of those games like Minecraft Story Mode or A Wolf Among Us. You play as a character slowly going through a 3D environment, picking up and collecting clues. You can do interviews, interact with objects, and occasionally slow down time with something I like to call kitty perception to examine things bit by bit. My personal favorite little mechanic is Black Sad's ability to make deductions and stuff. I'm real bad at it though, so it always took me a while to make the connections. I've always been so-so on this style of gameplay. At a certain point, I always just wish I was playing a traditional point and click. In this case, it might have been better if it was a point and click because this is Pendulo Studios' first game with fully 3D visuals and it shows. I'm not lying when I say this game runs like absolute fucking dog shit. No, YouTube is not fucking up. No, that's not your video freezing. That's just what this game is like. If you play this game, you will be sitting through one of the most jank experiences you'll ever get. I've had online matches with less stutter than this single player game. There are just so many rough edges in the way this game works that it's just impossible not to notice. The game reminds me of something like Sonic Heroes or Super Mario Sunshine, where the game definitely works, but it certainly isn't working perfectly. I did notice that it specifically ran worse when streaming, and I don't know why. 
Here's some footage of me playing it recently, and the game isn't running nearly as bad as it did. That being said, I will admit some of the jank was pretty funny. Sometimes a character's skirt will lift up of its own accord, and sometimes the sound effects will just not be there. In my personal experience, the jank goes away after the initial area, and from that point you get something stable. Of course, with something like this, I can't say you'll experience the same thing. Maybe it'll be smooth all the way for you, or maybe it'll be a messed up mess like Sonic 06. I can't say. All you can do is hope the jank is benign, like a character's fingers clipping through something rather than being sudden drops of frames or whatever this is. The only reason you should play this game is for the story, because the gameplay, even looking past the bugs, is mid. It's just another Telltale-like game except this one doesn't have the decency to work half the time. But my god, Telltale needs to hire the writers for this game because it is way more interesting than anything Telltale has to offer. You play as John Blacksad, who, like I mentioned before, is your typical noir detective. After finishing a case about a cheating husband, Blacksad finds himself investigating the death of Joe Dunn at the local gym. It was set up to look like suicide, but it becomes quite clear very quickly that foul play was involved. Was it Joe Dunn's student, Bobby Yale, the prize boxer who suddenly went missing? Was it O'Leary, the leader of a prolific sports gambling ring? Or perhaps it was someone else? You'll quickly be knee deep in this 1950s noir world of animals. And the game does a wonderful job of bringing that world to life, including all the ugly bits like the racism that's ever present in the comics. And while a lot of the characters you see in game are originals, they fit right into the world of Black Sad. The actual creators of the Black Sad comic were heavily involved in the game's production as consultants, so that's probably why it just works so well. The comics have always had some central idea or theme behind their stories. Whether it be racism and neo-Nazis in Arctic Nation, the Red Scare and Red Soul, or even drug company malpractice in A Silent Hell. The focus of Under the Skin is sports corruption, examining the way things worked when stuff like doping and bribes were common. It's an interesting subject that I don't think has been explored in literally any other thing I've watched or read. And the game does a wonderful job of bringing the comic's art style to life where characters manage to look realistic but also cartoony. I mean, so long as we don't bring any women into this. That's not a game thing, that's just a black sad thing. I genuinely don't know why he draws anthro women like that. It scares me. Putting the scary women aside, the game does have a breadth of options that allow for player expression. I like that the game keeps staying silent as a choice rather than always forcing you to speak. The game knows that an action is an action and will remember that. The game does implement QTEs, but they really aren't anything special. It's just a standard move your sticks and push buttons and all that. I do appreciate all the unique death that can happen if you fail though. One of the game's biggest virtues is definitely its soundtrack. It's full of that classic noir jazz that really gets you into the mindset of a noir detective. The streets may be a cruel mistress, but god damn it, she has banger after banger. Sadly, the music isn't enough for me to give this game more than a 6 out of 10. It'd easily be an 8 or a 9 if it wasn't so damn buggy. Is it wrong that I kind of want another Black Sad game? This is a great proof of concept that you can do something special with the series as long as it's not bugged to hell. But I digress, because I have to get to the next thing we're covering, Bluey the Video Game. And no, you did not mishear me, we really are talking about Bluey the Video Game. And before you ask, no, I have not watched the show, and no, I will not watch the show. I only played this game because it's on Game Pass. So, how good is this Bluey game? Should you buy it even if it's not on Game Pass? Spoiler warning, no, you definitely shouldn't. You shouldn't for a variety of reasons, but let's start with the fact that the story's one giant nothing burger. Basically, Bluey and her sister Bingo are on vacation when they discover an old map to their dad's treasure. The game essentially takes place over four days, with each day involving meeting characters from the show and getting a piece of the map from Bandit's brothers. 
In regards to gameplay, it's... it's playable, I'll give it that. You can choose to play as any of the show's four main characters. I personally went with Bandit Healer because I keep seeing his wing on my timeline and I think it looks really nice. Does who you play as have any effect on the game? Shit, I hope not. I don't want to play this again. What you do is walk around 3D environments, heading from clearly marked waypoint to clearly marked waypoint as you fulfill objectives. On one hand, it's tedious and removes pretty much any player creativity from the experience. The way to go is so clearly marked that if you get lost, it really is your fault for being kind of dumb, especially when the narrator and the characters don't stop telling you. On the other hand, this is a game for kids, so the intended audience is expected to be kind of dumb. It also makes the game shorter, and I'm not going to complain about that. You've got a few basic abilities to help you follow every waypoint. The first is jumping. You know things are desperate when I have to include jumping on a list of things you can do. This may sound weird, but it's actually a pretty good jump. Like I had no issue missing jumps and I'll praise it for that. The second thing you can do is grab objects. There's a lot of random bullshit lying around areas for your character to pick up and better yet, you can throw it too. It's honestly kind of fun, but only in that dumb way of doing something stupid for no reason. More interestingly, you can grab onto certain objects and push or pull them around. It's something you have to do quite often. Just hope that one of the characters don't get in the way because, oh my god, actual thing I had to sit through. The last thing you can do is kick, and is it wrong that the first thing I did when I discovered this was try to kick my kid? What? Don't look at me like that, you do the same thing. One thing I did find cool is that Blue and Bingo are actually able to get piggyback rides. Is it useful at any point? I'm pretty sure it isn't, but it is cute as hell. To actually give the game some genuine praise, I will say that the game's fucking gorgeous. It manages to recreate the look of the show way better than it honestly has any right to. Every environment looks like it came from the show, and it makes the game easy to look at. The only visual issue I have is a small one. Am I insane, or do the mouth animations just look worse than everything else? And I don't mean a frame thing or a lip flap thing, I mean a resolution thing. It's like the game is at 1080p, but the mouths are specifically at like 720. It's just a weird little thing that bothered me way more than it should. I'll also praise the game's variety of activities, most of which you end up collecting as minigames. They're not very fun, don't get me wrong, but you won't be doing the same thing twice. You'll collect each of these activities as you go about doing the main quest, getting one activity per day. And after collecting them, you can replay them whenever you want. The first is this game where you keep a balloon up in the air called Keepy Uppy. I had no idea that's the actual name for this game, when growing up I always just called it the balloon game. Then there's the floor is lava, which could actually be pretty fun if there was more than one level. The other two games are just riffs of the same idea. Magic Xylophone is just tag and Chattermax Chase is keep away. The games are multiplayer and competitive, so if you have friends, playing these games could give you something to do. I really hope you don't actually play this with your friends though. That'd be pathetic even by furry standards. This is gonna sound weird, but Bluey the video game actually has pretty good post-game. There are a ton of stickers all over the place, all of which get added to your sticker book. Even when the game literally starts telling you where they are after beating the game, you'll be hunting for a hot minute. And then there's the hats. You can unlock a wide variety of hats to make the characters wear to the point that it's just another thing to keep you busy. I'll admit, if you buy this game, you'll get a lot of bang for your buck. The only problem with that is it doesn't matter how few bucks you spend if that bang sucks. I get that this is a game for kids, but so is Putt-Putt and the other humongous entertainment games. If you want to stick your child in front of a screen for a while, those will not only keep them busy for longer, but be much cheaper. Bluey the video game gets a 4 out of 10 and not a single point higher. 
If I see any of you complain about that score in the comments, I'm going to lose my mind. But let's change things up from one of the most boring games I've ever played to the exact opposite. The next game is one of the most stressful things I have ever fucking played. It's a Chinese game called The Heartbeat. The game only cost $1, and that is a fitting price tag because the game doesn't offer hours of playtime or much variety. But what it does offer is quite the unique experience. It's the year 2077, and you play as the mayor of New Dunk City, which is currently going through a complete crisis. A strange virus is causing people's cybernetic implants to start malfunctioning. There's civil unrest, companies looking to make a profit, funding for impoverished groups and humanitarian needs, and even religious outcry. You also have your own wife and kids to worry about, but before you can head home, you rupture a vein. But your secretary has a temporary prosthetic for you to use so you can finish your work. Wait, really? Finish my work? I just ruptured a vein! Send me to the fucking hospital! Sadly, the temporary prosthetic is manually operated, so as you make your decisions, you best not forget to pump your own blood. The life of New Dunk City is in your hand, and your own life quite literally is too. It's that simple concept that got my attention and made me fall in love with this game. The idea of having to beat your own heart is so wonderfully stressful. It elevates what would be a pretty boring game where you just answer questions from your secretary into something that gets your own heart racing. From the setting of knowing your city is on the brink of destruction to the wife and child at home you hope to see at the end. Everything about the heartbeat from the setting to the game's mechanics just scream stress. Look at this, you have to multitask like a motherfucker. Read this entire block of text, decide what's best for your city while beating your own heart. And the game's actually pretty hard too, you barely have enough time to get through all the questions. If you don't manage to finish your work before dying, you get a game over. It's a cruel system that definitely could turn some people off. If you don't like the time system from Majora's Mask, you're going to fucking hate this game. It demands good execution, where missing a few beats might as well give you an immediate game over because you won't live long enough to finish your work. The fact that halfway through your heart will fly into a panic and then you have to pump even faster? It will take years off your lifespan. And I like the questions and responses too. Yes, they are huge blocks of text, but a lot of the added detail goes a long way to making the world feel real. There's so many extraneous details you find yourself just forgetting it's a game. It feels like you're reading a real report in all of its dry banality, which could easily get boring, but the game's stressful mechanics keep your attention. And your responses are nice and varied, giving you more than a good or bad option. And these responses do matter when it comes to the ending. Will your city cede into authoritarianism? Will the virus pass with minimal casualties? That's all on you, so be sure to think through the consequences of your actions. Or don't, because remember, you have a time limit. The game's stress-inducing nature and difficulty could be a turnoff for some, but the game lets you pick back up quickly and the questions never change, so it's totally possible to just memorize them. Sadly, that also means the game is a one-trick pony where there's not much variety in what you can do. But, the heartbeat takes a unique concept and does it well, even if that's the only thing it does. And the game's only a dollar, so you know what? I don't care if it only holds my attention for one or two hours. I'll give this game an 8 out of 10. It's a one-trick pony, but damn, it is a great pony. If you do try the heartbeat for yourself, do make sure to set the language to English in the options menu. Figured I should mention that before we move on to the final game. Okay, so I don't write these videos as a singular script, rather as separate pieces I can put together into one sequence. I'm telling you this because I originally started this segment with an introduction to Echo Project and all their games and stuff, but seeing as how I already did that, I have no real way to introduce this game. So, um, Glory Hounds. A visual novel made by Echo Project, but very different from their other games. Rather than being a space opera or whatever Echo is, this is a game about superheroes. Before I get into the characters or the setting, I want to discuss the visual novel's visuals. 
solely because this visual novel has one of the most wonderful visual styles I have ever seen. Fundamentally, Glory Hounds is about superheroes, so the art style looks like a comic book. All the characters are drawn with those Ben Day dots like those old comics. What's even cooler is this, rather than getting CGs, we get comic pages. These comic pages are wonderful and I prefer them so much more than regular CGs. They just add to the feel, making it super easy to get immersed in the world and its characters. But let me actually get to introducing things. The country is Batvia, which is kinda sorta like Scandinavia, and the city is Shippersburg. Our protagonist is the Dalmatian, Alex DeRoy, who's finishing his day by unwinding at his favorite gay bar with his favorite gay friends. He tries to make a good day even better by going to a corner store for his favorite snack when it suddenly gets robbed. Unable to stand by and do nothing, Alex intervenes, but the day is actually saved when the superhero Dawnhound arrives. And to make matters worse, he's fired from his job the next day, but his actions did impress Dawnhound, impressing him so much he's willing to give our out-of-work doggy a new job as his sidekick. Honestly, as far as setups go, it feels kind of generic. Even outside of superhero stories, the protagonist managing to find new opportunity through their spunk and moxie is a common setup. And it's not helped by the protagonist fitting into a very basic everyman kind of role within the story. Even later on, when we learn that he wants to be a superhero to get out of this rut he's been stuck in in life and be like his father who's a firefighter actually out there and rescuing people. Like yeah, it's consistent character motivation and it does make logical sense, but it's also not the first time I've seen something like this. Alex is yet another good kid who's pushed to save people to follow in the footsteps of his role model, like Peter Parker with Uncle Ben or Deku with All Might. Alex is basically Deku if Horikoshi wasn't a coward and made him a gay fail boy. Thankfully, the other characters are much cooler, my personal favorite being Dawnhound, aka Raul Brevard, CEO of Brevard Enterprises. You expect him to be kind of like Batman, super rich CEO with no magical powers, he even has a butler. But Dawnhound is very unserious, he's not dark and brooding, rather he's goofy and fun loving. And when out of costume, you also find that he's pretty shy. He's just one of many multifaceted characters in the visual novel. The weakest part of Glory Hounds really is the protagonist. Alex is just so standard. The writing around him is good. He gets interesting jokes and doesn't bore me, but when I try to dig deeper into him, I just find nothing unique. And it's so weird because usually this problem happens in visual novels where the protagonist is faceless, but no, Alex does have a face, he's just always overshadowed. Even the antagonists are more interesting than Alex. Ahab is a giant whale criminal who speaks like a pirate for no actual reason. He's also gay and kind of maybe sort of dating our protagonist. And Camus is a chameleon thief obsessed with fashion. Camus even has a habit of joining Alex in breaking the fourth wall. And Alex just doesn't compare to these people, and it's a real shame too, because I know Alex has much, much more room to grow and become more interesting. My personal take on the problem with Alex is the lack of an unresolved issue. Using Echo, for example, the protagonist in that game, Chase, has a ton of unresolved issues which push him forward into the story. Just naming a few off the top of my head, there's Sydney, his school project, getting back together with Leo, and etc. However, Alex doesn't necessarily have a personal issue driving the story forward. There was that listlessness and desire to do more, but after becoming Duskhound, he kind of resolved it. That being said, the visual novel manages to work past the protagonist due to very strong writing. In a genre that's saturated with thriller, horror, and drama, for Gloryhounds to just be a straight comedy and good comedy is quite refreshing. It makes Glory Hounds an easy, fun read that is thoroughly enjoyable. The visual novel is also linear, adding to the ease of reading because you don't have to worry about all those choices and stuff. I also won't hold Alex's boringness against the visual novel too much. It's only on chapter, no, well, actually, issue three, get it, like a comic issue? So cute. So there's still a lot of room to grow on Alex's part. Glory Hounds is a visual novel I thoroughly enjoy.
I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10, but if it keeps this up, when it finishes, it's definitely going to get that perfect 10 out of 10. I actually really liked making this video and definitely should get to making a third one. I just need to get off my ass and actually play those games so I can review them. Do remember that I have a link to the Itch or Steam page for all of these games in the comment section, so do be sure to check that out. But as much as I enjoyed making this video, I do have to end it, so let's get right to our Patreon shoutouts. For our three stars, we have special thanks to 87 Werehog, Deku, Zora Chow, Choron, Garon LeFay, Dragging Yara, Unon RC, Lightning Shadow, Kayun, and Maronla. For four stars, we have Miki Moon and Miko, the Wrecking Crew. And for our Super D Duper special five star shoutouts, we have first, Vanilla Flower, the Lost Arch Nemesis. Second, Poor Mage, the Side Hustle. Then, the good old days, the crisis at Coney Island. Followed by Hodari Lion, the king of the spill. Next, Sky King 64, the roof running reptile. And finally, Mahogasaur, the wrath of the lady. Thank you for watching. Do be sure to like and subscribe and check out my Kofi and Patreon. As always, this is Fury signing out.